For those of you who are signing in as our participants, um, welcome to the Food is Medicine uh, virtual symposium. We will get started in just one minute. We're just gonna give one more minute for attendees to enter the webinar. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started even as folks are still filtering in. Um, hello and welcome to session two of the annual Food is Medicine Symposium. My name is Katie Garfield and I'm a clinical instructor at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School. I'm so pleased to be hosting this symposium for our ninth year uh, with our partners at Community Servings, a medically tailored meal provider here in Boston, Massachusetts. As a reminder, this year's symposium consists of two webinar ses sessions, each focused on the role of food as medicine for specific populations. Our first session, which occurred last week, focused on food as medicine for older adults. Today's session will explore food as medicine for pregnancy, postpartum, and early childhood. Before we begin, I'd like to just cover a few brief housekeeping items. First, Please note that we will be using the Q&A feature. Wherever possible, we will answer questions directly in the Q&A. If we have time, we will also direct Q&A questions to our panel during the panel discussion at the end of the webinar. Second, uh, we will be recording this event. The recording will be made available to all registrants by early next week. The recording, um, along with the recording for session one, will be posted on our website at www.chilpi.org. So with those few brief points in mind, let's go ahead and begin the substance of today's webinar. Each year, we hold our Food as Medicine Symposium to lift up and celebrate innovations in the food as medicine space. This year, our ninth annual Food as Medicine Symposium, we are excited to explore the role of food as medicine for specific populations. Food as medicine typically refers to nutrition services provided to improve the health of individuals living with a critical or chronic illness. However, a growing body of research has also begun to highlight the benefits of food as medicine services for other specific populations. Today's webinar will focus on the role of food as medicine in pregnancy, postpartum, and early childhood. And I will say at the outset, the urgency around improving maternal and child health has never been clearer. We know that households with children have been among the hardest hit with food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic. And just yesterday, Vice President Kamala Harris hosted a summit to mark the first ever White House Maternal Health Day of Action to discuss the maternal health crisis and our national policy response. And so I'm very excited about today's panel. We'll hear three presentations highlighting the role of nutrition and food as medicine services in responding to these trends. These presentations will be followed by a discussion with our speakers. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Stephanie Ettinger de Cuba, Executive Director of Children's Health Watch, a research and policy network based here in Boston at the Boston Medical Center with research sites at Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Little Rock, and Boston. Uh, Dr. Ettinger de Cuba has worked on issues of social determinants of health for young children and their families in program policy and advocacy and research roles for more than two decades. She has published widely on a variety of subjects from food security, housing stability, to healthcare. 
with a particular focus on issues of equity and children of immigrants. Uh, Ms. Edinger Kuba received her BA from the University of Michigan, her MPH in International Health, and her PhD in Health Services Research from the Boston University School of Public Health. Next, we'll hear from Sissy Bonini, the Executive Director of EDSF Vouchers for Veggies program at the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations in San Francisco. Sissy is a seasoned nonprofit executive and has established numerous deep and well-respected relationships across the network of public, private, and governmental organizations committed to addressing the needs of and serving the most vulnerable in the community. Prior to EDSF, she spent over two decades leading an array of programs serving homeless and low-income individuals and families, including the largest free meals program in San Francisco. Sissy has a BA in sociology from Hamilton College and an MPA from the University of Southern California. And finally, we'll hear from Becca Kahn and Ashley Hayslip of Food and Friends, a medically tailored meal program based in Washington, DC. Becca Kahn has worked at Food and Friends since 2018. Prior to joining Food and Friends, Becca worked at MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute as an inpatient and outpatient dietitian. Rebecca brings years of experience working and volunteering in social services. She has been volunteering with various food access organizations since childhood and has never stopped. And she was in fact introduced to the concept of food as medicine um, and the broader community as a volunteer at community servings while an undergrad at Boston University. And then Ashley Hayslip has worked as a community dietitian at Food and Friends since 2018. Prior to joining Food and Friends, Ashley worked at the American Red Cross WIC program in San Diego, California, where she provided nutrition counseling and breastfeeding education. Ashley is currently pursuing a master's degree in public health at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So welcome, I'm so excited to hear from our wonderful panel um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our first panelist, Stephanie Edinger de Cuba. Hi, everybody. Um, hang on, let me just share my screen. Um, there we go. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. <clears throat> I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm still getting over a cold and so I might cough while I speak. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna really um, broadly talk about uh, food insecurity and the really unique nutrition um, needs in uh, pregnancy and early childhood. Um, just do a very much a highlights reel talking about uh, racial, ethnic inactivity and equities and food insecurity and impact of COVID and then a snippet about some forthcoming work um, uh, regarding WIC. I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. So the first thousand days are just an incredibly important period, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also talk about and before um, how the nutritional status of people entering pregnancy is also incredibly important. Um, but in that those first thousand days, which um, ca uh, counts um, the nine months of pregnancy and then the two calendar years following birth, this is really when, you know, brain development is happening for the fetus and lifelong health um, trajectories are established for physical formation of, of the baby and um, immune system, um, sort of like the foundations of that. And, and then the predisposition for disease or not um, is also um, established. And, and so this, this is really important um, period for this intergenerational transmission of health. And frankly, in short, um, getting kids off to an equitable start in life. Um, that said, food insecurity in pregnancy um, really increases the risk of babies being born with low birth weight. Um, and uh, low birth weight puts kids at risk uh, for later heart disease and possible metabolic disease, uh, disorders um, as adults. Um, those are related. <laughs> in part to um, low birth weight is in part related to micronutrient deficiencies, deficiencies, but also inadequate um, quantity and quality of food, which is food insecurity. Um, and then I also think it's really important to talk about the mental health aspect of food insecurity and that relationship in um, pregnancy. And that is through stress and that includes racism. Um, uh, there's also some evidence that food insecurity is related to preterm birth. Um, certainly to neural tube defects um, and uh, something called anencephaly. For those who don't know what that is, it's sort of an incomplete formation of the brain and cranium. Um, and that's related to uh, folic acid. Um, there's also a higher risk of blueberry, blue baby congenital heart disease where you have um, oxygen for blood that's flowing out to the rest of the body and making kids look blue. 
um, <coughs> excuse me, um, also some higher risk of postpartum hemorrhage um, in labor and delivery and um, relationships to iron deficiency there. And of course, all of these things increase risk for infant mortality. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the pregnant per person themselves. Um, uh, obviously food insecurity in pregnancy means a nutritionally depleted person and uh, um, related to poor physical and mental health, and then also increased susceptibility to infections through immune depletion. So um, the, uh, the early childhood part of this is, um, you know, this brain development piece is incredibly important. This is really these, these first thousand days is when synapse formation is happening, the neural networks and the architecture of the brain is literally being formed. Um, that first year of life, you can see on the right-hand side, that sort of gray box. There's these three arcs, that sensory pathways, language and higher cognitive function, all of those peak in the first year of life. So nutrition is essential for optimal brain development. Um, this is this, um, you know, um, neural networks being created, these, this blooming and pruning process in the first three years, children's brains will have twice as many synapses as they have in, in adulthood. And it sets our trajectory for cognitive and social emotional development, school readiness, academic achievement, educational attainment. And it's, and it's the brain that children will have for the rest of their life. So while absolutely, I don't want to say that there's no um, remediation possible, obviously with the best start we can get kids off to the better. So pulling back um, up to like 30 or 50,000 feet, um, you know, uh, thinking about COVID, this isn't specific to pregnancy, but you know, the, our national data tell us that the prevalence of food insecurity in uh, during COVID actually stayed the same to pre-COVID and they attribute that to um, the infusion of resources through COVID relief programs. But I do feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that if we don't look deeper, we're missing the story. And that is that in fact, there were huge inequities uh, still um, continuing and worsened um, in um, uh, food insecurity, one in six Hispanic households, one in five black households, but one in 14 white households. So really big differences there. And um, I'm gonna very quickly, very highlights real version, give you some research that kind of explains some of why we think that may be happening. These are, um, so Children's Health Watch is my organization where like Katie said, a network of pediatricians, health researchers and child and health policy experts were focused on early childhood and connecting research and policy. Um, and we interview families in uh, uh, medical settings in four cities and, <laughs> Um, we followed up with families that we had interviewed pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and found that among those families with very young children, household food insecurity, the orange line had doubled, child food insecurity had nearly quadrupled, and behind on rent had increased uh, by 50% uh, during the COVID period. Um, these are all families with kids under the age of four. Why is this not advancing now? There. Um, and then we looked, um, uh, um, so things were very hard for everyone. They were particularly hard for our immigrant uh, families. So comparing our, um, our US families with US born mothers, they were 1.4 times more likely to be household food insecure. And yet our immigrant families were 2.2 times more likely to be uh, food insecure. Um, and then you see an even greater um, uh, uh, risk there on the right hand side with behind on rent. So that gets back to policies. And uh, what I want you to take away from here is the top is our US born uh, families, the bottom is our immigrant families. We, we were looking um, in this piece of research and there's the link to their full report on the left um, at SNAP and economic impact payments, what you may have known as stimulus payments. And this just shows like who received what. And um, our, in our US born families, just 4% of the families didn't receive either SAP or a stimulus payment, but almost a quarter of our immigrant families didn't receive that. And we have other data on differences by race and ethnicity. And so I think that really gets to sort of these, the policy exclusions and um, problems that are created and lock people out of getting the support they need. But we know that support really makes a difference. So um, I'm sure most, if not all of you know about WIC, um, it's a, a program um, that is got a long history of research demonstrating good, um, better birth outcomes. 
and um, serves all women during pregnancy, including uh, if, if they're income eligible and at nutritional risk, but they don't um, have any immigration restrictions and thus no data on uh, immigrant women during pregnancy. And we know there's something called the healthy birth weight paradox where despite maybe um, lower so socioeconomic status, our immigrant moms in the US have healthier birth weights than uh, US born moms. Um, but we don't know whether WIC makes a difference because we don't have that data even among that group that has better birth outcomes. And so we looked at that in our data and we looked at this all immigrant five city sample of over 9,000 mothers and found really that prenatal WIC made a big difference in birth outcomes that the, the babies had better birth weights and there was a, a lower odds of low birth weight. Again, setting this like a, going back to the beginning, setting kids on a, on a strong trajectory. So I think I'll just end there and say, I think this kind of speaks to the power of um, policy to make a difference. Excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. I think that's a great way uh, to kick things off, really giving us a sense of the research in this space and how nutrition um, impacts these populations. Also a great setup for some of the important uh, policy pieces that we'll be looking into as we get to our panel discussion. So next, we're going to turn to Sissy Bonini um, to be followed by uh, Becca Kahn and, and Ashley Hayslip. And in these two presentations, we're gonna shift away from that initial statement of the problem and start thinking about some of the ways that food as medicine interventions like produce prescriptions and medically tailored meals can be part of the solution in responding to these nutrition needs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and let Sissy get started. Hi everyone, um, love to follow that great presentation by Stephanie, it's so great. Um, I, I will, there may be some duplication in my uh, presentation with um, some of the uh, themes you've heard from Stephanie. So um, my name is Sissy Bonini, I'm the Executive Director of Vouchers for Veggies, also known as Eat SF in San Francisco. We are a fruit and vegetable voucher program, um, also known as Produce RX um, programs when embedded in healthcare. And, um, we're primarily located in San Francisco, but we've replicated our program um, across the country uh, in five geographic locations, including Los Angeles, Boulder, also in um, rural and semi-rural areas in Virginia, California, and soon to be in Louisiana. So, and if we're on, can we do this on the, um, can we go to the next slide? So I'll be discussing our partnership um, we have in San Francisco with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and San Francisco WIC, um, where we are working with the aim to improve dietary intake and health outcomes during pregnancy. Katie, are you able to move the um, deck forward? Oh, I apologize. I think I have the wrong um, piece sharing. One moment. Okay. Yeah, if you go back a couple slides, that'd be great. Fabulous. Okay, next slide. <laughs> this is great. And next slide. <laughs> So um, our partnership with uh, uh, San Francisco WIC um, really started with um, some um, pretty shocking inequity um, that was highlighted in the disparities uh, in food security rates among pregnant people in San Francisco and WIC, um, wherein 27% of uh, Latinx pregnant people um, reported as food insecure, as well as 20% of Black African American, 7% of Asian Pacific Islander pregnant folks, and almost 0% of white folks. So we really, um, the San Francisco Department of Public Health uh, initiated this partnership between EDSF and SFWIC with the goal of reducing these disparities of food insecurity rates and improving birth outcomes for low income folks. Um, we worked together with, with WIC staff, which was, um, was super interesting because WIC is already a, as we know, has a um, CV, a, a cash value benefit fruit and vegetable supplement, which was, um, was at the time nine or $11. And then we had a separate voucher program on top of that with an additional $40 a month 
for our um, pregnant folks. Um, we implemented across all of the six WIC sites in San Francisco um, in an effort to reach more than um, we're, our, our goal is really to reach 100% of low income pregnant folks with this extra um, uh, healthy food supports. So we also worked with a number of other um, CBOs, including the Native Health, um, Native American Health Center, Black Infant Health, Homeless Prenatal, and a variety of clinics and hospitals, uh, particularly clinics um, focused on ser serving immigrant populations. Next slide. Um, I don't need to go through this because it was done so well by Stephanie before, but this is just, again, is, is uh, some of the um, in health impacts of food insecurity during pregnancy. I want to double down on the stress um, and just how important the, what the feedback we got from, from our uh, moms and pregnant folks, just about that, that stress of not having the um, appropriate healthy food for yourself and for your um, family and for your, um, um, for your child. So uh, I uh, just, just want to double down on, on, on all of these um, health impacts. Go ahead to the next slide. How's it work? The program's um, pretty straightforward. We enroll through um, the CBOs and WIC. Um, participants receive their vouchers um, from the WIC staff, or we also mail vouchers directly to um, participants. Um, they're redeemable. Uh, what's unique about uh, Vouchers for Veggies ESF is we really specialize in creating a vendor network, um, particularly in underserved neighborhoods or areas that might be food deserts or food swamps. So our vendor network includes larger grocery stores, corner stores, farmers markets, and we really focus on the culturally relevant foods for folks so that they're able to feed their families with the, with the um, dietary um, and cultural preferences for their families. Um, we then um, reimburse once the vouchers or we also have a produce debit card are uh, redeemed, we reimburse the vendors. On to the next slide. The impact. So um, since we started, we've served over 4,500 um, pregnant WIC folks. Um, uh, again, we have a, a, the stores. Um, what's interesting about the stores is we, uh, again, a lot of our, our smaller stores are um, owned by um, uh, people of color and that uh, we have, we know that part of the aim of our program is to increase food security, increase health, but also economically support those vendors in those underserved areas. Um, we have an 81% voucher redemption rate. Um, that This is just a note that this is pre-COVID um, numbers on that. Um, and uh, um, and certainly the demand for the vouchers went up during uh, during COVID, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, the, the great increase of needs for folks with um, young children. Um, and we have like an over 90% satisfaction rate. And um, as a matter of fact, we have a wait list of over 9,000 households in San Francisco for this program. Um, although not for pregnant folks, we tried to, we're trying to serve 100% of pregnant folks. Um, we have done a study on our program to assess the impact. Um, and this was published in the Journal of Health, Education, and Nutrition. And um, we looked at our participants uh, in, we compared to a um, historical control group. And um, we found that 30% of our participants increased their food security at least one level, according to the USDA um, uh, 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 assessment. They also increased their, uh, the frequency of, of um, of intake of fruits and vegetables by 0.73, which is really great. But really um, significantly, there was a 37% reduced risk of preterm birth, again, compared to that historical control group. Um, now we have a follow-up study in progress um, that is, uh, again, with pregnant um, folks in San Francisco, but we'll be uh, using a randomized control group and using um, some other counties, um, Alameda and uh, San Mateo uh, for the control group for the for this. So we're hoping to get the results of that in 2022 or early 2023. Great. And that's it. Well, excellent. Thank you, Sissy. Um, I think that's a great example of a program that's working to provide uh, a food as medicine intervention, so a produce prescription um, to help serve this population. And so next, I'm going to invite uh, Ashley and Becca to join us to talk about another intervention, uh, medically tailored meals, um, which Food and Friends is using uh, to improve maternal health. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Ashley. I'm uh, one of the community dietitians at Food and Friends, which is in Washington, DC. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the little background on Food and Friends um, as an organization. And then I'll speak a little bit on the um, program we have working with pregnant clients and postpartum clients. Next slide. 
Um, so some background on Food and Friends. You know, we were founded in 1988 during the HIV AIDS crisis. And in the first year we started out pretty small, we were serving about 60 people. Um, over, over the years, we've expanded to include other illnesses, including cancer and other life challenging illnesses in 2000. Um, so to date, uh, now we've served over 23 million meals um, and served over 3,700 adults and children. Okay, next. Um, so here's Food and Friends mission on this. Um, our main goal is to improve the lives and health of people living with life challenging illnesses, including HIV, AIDS, cancer, diabetes, among other illnesses as well. Um, and Food and Friends is built on the premise that anyone can get sick and everyone can help. Okay, next slide. Um, so what makes us a little bit unique um, is for our meal provision is that we send medically tailored meals. Um, so clients are referred to our service from a healthcare provider or a health plan, um, and the meals are tailored to the client's medical needs um, by our team of registered dietitians here, and they're designed to improve health outcomes, they're designed to lower cost of care and increase patient satisfaction. Next slide. Um, so Food and Friends also meets the needs of a client's family. Um, the first dietitian that was hired by Food and Friends um, noticed that the clients were sharing their meal deliveries with their, their children and their families. So this prompted us to start sending meals to clients' children and dependents and also the caretakers. Um, and this way that we can still work on the client's health and nutrition, but also improve the entire household's um, well-being and health. Next slide. Um, so in an effort to expand our services to reach more clients, Food and Friends created a partnership um, with a managed care organization in DC in 2018. Um, and so this MCO, um, we basically came to them and asked them what group of their members they wanted to you know, focus on for this partnership. And they wanted to focus on their pregnant and postpartum members. Um, so they wanted to enroll anyone in their Bright Star program, which was their, um, is their maternity care program. And so members were eligible to receive Food and Friends meals throughout their pregnancy and up to 56 days after their due date. Okay, next slide. Um, in addition to the meals, um, I was also brought on um, at this time to work with these clients. Um, so the nutrition counseling for um, pregnancy and postpartum is very individualized. It's based on what's going on in their health at that time. Um, you know, there's a unique uh, nutrition requirements during pregnancy and also while recovering from birth. Um, and then also I was just making sure that they were connected to other services like WIC if they weren't enrolled yet, um, lactation services, other infant supplies like diapers and um, other food resources as well. Next slide. Um, so I know Stephanie and Cece talked um, a lot about already the health inequities for our low income um, pregnant people, but um, I do want to talk a little bit specifically about DCs. Um, so here's some statistics here, but um, we have a higher mort maternal mortality rate compared to the rest of the country. And that rate is even higher for our, our black mothers um, with 71 deaths per 100,000 live births compared to the national um, number of 63.8 deaths per 100,000 births. Um, DC also has a higher infant mortality rate compared to the rest of the country. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here's just a breakdown of where our pregnant and postpartum clients live. Um, so DC is split into eight different wards um, and um, eight, uh, ward A, as you can see, is where the bulk of our clients were living with 52%. And ward A is where most of the food deserts in the DC, uh, in the city of DC are. Um, so when starting on service, we screened everyone for um, food insecurity and 63 were considered food insecure when starting on service. Next slide. Um, and then here's just another visual of DC's wards. Um, and so that bottom blue section is ward eight and the pink circles indicates where food deserts um, are in the city. Um, and if you can see a big bulk of our clients were living in those um, areas where the food deserts are in ward eight. Next slide. So these are just some of the reasons the MCO wanted to focus on their pregnant and postpartum members. Um, and the hope was that it would you know, provide benefits and improve their health outcomes. Um, and there was benefits for the plan as well, um, you know, less ER visits and um, just better health outcomes for everyone. Next slide. And um, so the outcomes, so in that first year, we served 447 
um, of their members who were pregnant or postpartum. And um, the MCO was really interested in looking at ER usage. And uh, before members began receiving meals, there were um, 296 uh, members with more than one uh, more than one ER visit. And after six months of receiving meals, um, that number dropped to 199 members uh, with more than one ER visit. And even clients that were on service for only three months, so if they were um, referred later in the pregnancy or right after giving birth, um, they still saw a decrease in ER visits after they began to receive the meals. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, client feedback on the service was very positive. Um, in one of our most recent surveys, um, there were 607 pre uh, pregnant or postpartum women that were served and 303 were pregnant or postpartum, and then the 204 were their dependents. Um, and you can see on the screen, there's um, just different feedback that they provided. And I'll just note that 79% experienced less stress procuring food after um, being on service, and 63% were better able to manage their pregnancy and postpartum transitions. Um, yeah, so that's all they got there. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'd now like to sort of invite back all of our panelists um, for a Q&A discussion. Um, I think those presentations have provided a great foundation of giving a sense of the work that you're doing on the ground, as well as the scope of this issue. Um, and so uh, to kick off our Q&A, I will remind uh, the audience, for anyone participating, if you have questions that you would like to submit to our panel, please do use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And wherever possible, we're going to try to answer those questions um, as we go. But to begin, I'd like to start with a question for our entire panel. Um, this is the same question that we started with in our last webinar session on older adults. Um, we've recently been seeing the phrase nutrition security used in addition to food insecurity. Can you comment on how this term resonates in terms of programming, advocacy, and research uh, related to pregnant, postpartum, and very young populations? And I'll open that to whoever would like to respond first. I can. Uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think it, it's fundamentally, I think um, people are starting to use that term, have sort of the same goals they're wanting healthy, affordable of food available to all. I do have, and I know that Children's Health Watch has concerns ab about the term because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, food insecurity actually includes that nutrition aspect. That was a really key component of the development of the measure itself. There were nutritionists, uh, dietitians, registered dietitians and others very deeply involved in that work um, and part of the testing and, and the development. And um, <clears throat> personally, I think it is to some, it's, I think it's, it's a term that's out there. It's like out of the gate, it's not going away anytime soon, but I do worry that it becomes a distraction from the, 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 the changes that we really need to really fully address food insecurity, which is a gigantic problem in the United States. And um, I think a, a piece of that concern is uh, that it, it can lend itself to individualization of risk. Um, and there's sort of insufficient emphasis that I've seen on, on sort of the structural and the policy and a lot of focus on the individual, which um, as, you know, frankly, Ashley's presentation like drove it home, like there's, you know, the food deserts, there's very structural reasons for the outcomes that we are all seeing in our own environments. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Excellent. Sissy? Yeah, um, I mean, I can, I, I, I just want to say that, I mean, we, we talk a lot about food insecurity and the impact on health, right? That because people make the economically rational decision <laughs> to purchase food that is not healthy for you because that's what's in reach, because that's what you can afford. And that's a broken food system. So I would say that, um, you know, food insecurity and nutrition insecurity are tied together. I just wanna address this very dangerous myth that low income people don't wanna eat healthy because over and over again, I could, I just say like, I present to like families and they know that you know, like, do you eat, well, eat fruits and vegetables? Yes, wanna eat more fruits and vegetables. Why don't you? 100%, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. So. This, this whole, um, if nutrition security gets us to understand that the system is, is shift, has to shift so that 
food that is better for you and, and creates better health results and wellness across your lifespan is more affordable, then this is better for everybody. So that's fine. Um, I can speak a little bit on just our program and our efforts to, you know, meet the client's needs, not just medically, but also when it comes to food preferences. Um, and so we're sending meals and, you know, they're, they're getting set a, set a lot of meals. So we do try our best during nutrition counseling to make sure that it's, you know, working for them, what we are actually sending, the variety. Um, and we do have some ways they can modify for preference. Um, so, you know, eliminations like taking any seafood out or vegetarian or no dairy. So we do things like that. Um, and then another part of the program that I didn't mention is we also have a grocery program. So um, some clients will just going to prepare to have prepare their own food, which is totally great. And if they're able to and well enough to do that. Um, so, you know, it gives them more autonomy over their meal choices. And um, a lot of our pregnant postpartum clients um, usually do choose our grocery program because they usually are a little bit healthier and are able to prepare their own food for themselves and their families. I'll just weigh in very quickly on there, tying those couple of things together to say, um, I agree with Cece in that, um, you know, people do want more fruits and vegetables. And we hear that all the time, whether it's our pregnant and postpartum clients um, or others who want to switch to groceries in particular, because we send fresh fruits and vegetables and they that's what we hear all the time. We just want more fresh fruits and vegetables. So agreed. People, people know that message. They hear it. They want it. And I think some of this conversation um, leads really nicely into my next question, since we're bringing out already some of the structural issues and ultimately their impacts across different populations. So my next question is, um, pregnant people and young children across the United States continue to experience disparities in health outcomes based on race, income, and geography. How have these disparities impacted the work at each of your organizations? And how do we ensure that nutrition interventions and food as medicine interventions specifically respond to rather than deepen these disparities? Um, Stephanie, I know that this is an area that Children's Health Watch has been thinking a lot about a lot. Would you like to jump in first? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I would even broaden it beyond disparities, but to inequities, which really gets to that structure piece again, the underlying underlying structure structure and um, uh, in our work, we're trying to think really carefully about how we can sort of make those pieces visible and not just say, oh, food insecurity is related to health, which absolutely is, but like the why, how did we get there? Um, and I think one of the pieces is related to, I know I did like the, the you know, very speed version of it, but you know, the, the research that I presented, which really at the bottom of it was about, um, explicit and implicit inclusions in policy. And I think, you know, you could talk about it from the, the food industry point of view, from agriculture, from all kinds of different pieces. Our work is focused mainly on um, social policy, but, you know, to, to be more specific, like just to give SNAP as an example, you know, we have explicit exclusions that that um, keep uh, immigrants who've, who are otherwise eligible, but have been here less than five years um, out of um, uh, eligibility for SNAP. They're not allowed to give it, get, receive it. That's like an explicit exclusion on participation. But then we have implicit ones too, like just a very recent one was during the, the pandemic, the an initial boost to SNAP benefits um, boosted everybody up to the maximum benefit, but if you were already at the maximum and therefore by definition had a very low income, you did not get any increase. And so we left out millions of very low income people um, from getting more assistance in a time of great need. So I, that's, and those things themselves are related to race and ethnicity and to where you are and those kinds of things. So um, at any rate, that's just an example of the, the sorts of things that I think drive those inequities and, and in turn drive our work. So I can speak to a little bit. Um, so in terms of our program, um, especially with geography or a lot of our clients, as I said, in Ward 8 don't have access to getting to the grocery store, there might be one grocery store in the entire ward. Um, so our program is just meant to address that issue right there, that barrier of bringing the food to them. Um, and I will say too that our program doesn't have an income requirement. So a lot of our clients may have income that they're not eligible for SNAP or WIC. 
um, but they're still not quite able to afford and access um, healthy, healthy food. So um, we can be a service that meets their needs during that time. I'm happy to, to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think programs need to fit the unique needs of their communities. Um, and I think you have to really fund the full cost of these programs. I just wanna say that I was really struck by Ashley's program. Feeding the whole household is, is brilliant, but costs more money. Um, our programs, in order to, we spend more money creating a vendor network in low income neighborhoods um, versus just a card that can be used at, at all grocery stores. And that's um, on purpose, but it, you, we really need to, to think about and fund these interventions to the full cost so that we are apps, we were meeting the need, the direct needs of the population served. And that can look very different in different neighborhoods. I just wanna super duper emphasize that point. I think so often we underfund the things and then we go, oh, it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because we didn't invest in it appropriately. So at any rate, just like super underscore that. <laughs> well, and I think that connects up with actually a number of questions that we've seen coming in through the Q&A. So I wanna pose sort of two connected questions um, to our panelists. Um, first, uh, for, for Sissy and for Ashley and Becca, um, we've had some questions about how your programs are funded questions about um, are they being reimbursed by insurance or how else are they funded? Um, and to the extent that they serve the entire household, is that funded differently? Um, and then a follow-up question from Nancy in, in the Q&A asking, just to clarify, are we looking for new funding to support this valuable need for pregnant women and their children? Or do we need to look at fine tuning the spend of the millions of dollars being spent in the maternal child health arena? essentially, do current programs need a new focus? So to summarize, my questions are, what does current funding look like for your program? And what do you see as how we um, expand upon that funding moving forward? What is the goal here? So I can speak on um, for the funding for Food and Friends, um, particularly with our partnerships. The reason we partner with health insurance companies is to be able to cover more clients. And um, so the health insurance will reimburse us um, for the meals that we send them. And when it comes to dependents, um, typically most, as long as they have the same health insurance plan, they're happy to reimburse for those um, dependents as well. Um, and then some of the health insurance plans, they don't, it doesn't matter if they have the same insurance or not. So it, it varies based on who the, who's funding it, um, how many dependents we can cover. Um, and then uh, Becca, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit on our regular funding too. Yeah, sure. I was just going to say that uh, that sort of goes into the next question also of like, what's the goal here? Because the goal is really to make it easier for us to get this food to people. And health insurance seems to be a really good way to do that because most of our other clients, as you saw on that slide deck there, the, the this partnership is really just a fraction of the clients that we're serving. Um, and most of them, it's fundraising. We're a nonprofit organization and we do fundraising to feed people and their families. So this is a newer model for us to work with health insurance companies and ask them to fund either the clients directly and or their family members. Um, and the goal is, yes, to fine tune these programs, but to get more health insurance companies really to realize that this is a way to improve people's quality of life and help the health insurance company um, by feeding the whole family, keeping them out of the hospital, keeping their mental health bills lower. Um, we talked about stress. So I hope that that answers that second part of the question too. Absolutely. And I'd love to hear from Sissy as well to see how that aligns with what um, you've seen in your programs and, and your ideas for funding moving forward. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we get creative. <laughs> it's funny. We're like, wherever we can fund, we want to fund. But honestly, the um, we've, we've looked at like local um, DPH funding for sure. Um, in, we've looked at a model where it's actually supported by soda tax. So, um, and that's uh, our program in San Francisco, partially funded by that, partially by, by private donations funded, but also um, our replicated program in Boulder, Colorado. So, so that's an interesting model. Can't tell you enough, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, just increase the WIC CVB, and then we don't have to have a voucher program on top of a voucher program, right? So I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but I'd love to see that. Um, 
we are absolutely um, dedicated to try to um, embed these produce RX programs because we know they work. We know that they're successful into um, healthcare through Medicaid and Medicare. So I think there's a huge opportunity there, and um, particularly in the space. I couldn't agree more on that front. So <laughs> thank you, Sissy. And let me just see, Stephanie, if you have anything to add on this topic um, about thinking about the way that we're using funding in this country and how it might be used um, to better address these populations' nutrition needs. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot to say on that topic <laughs> the whole hour. Um, um, uh, you know, I think I, I concur with the, the move to, you know, have those partnerships with health insurance. I think that's that's very fruitful and um, and certainly targeting those groups. I feel like um, I don't want to advocate for taking funding away from things, but I think it gets back to this prior issue of frankly, are we investing enough, right? And and there's you know it gets also to well, what about the people who don't have health insurance and are they getting served uh, and um, you know, uh, and, and frankly, having healthy pregnancies and kids get off to a good start is good for absolutely everyone. And this should be, a, a, I think early child pregnancy and early childhood in general is just, um, one piece of our society that is, um, hugely ignored and not sufficiently invested in our, inv you know, there's this great graph. I can't even think who made it anymore about like our investment in, in school age children, I have two school age children, so I love them and I want to invest in them. But our investments are like, you know, the polar opposite of like the impact that you can have in, in this country. We invest way more in older children and way less in younger children. And it really needs to flip or at least be even. Um, so I know that didn't exactly answer your exact question, but I, I think that there, there's like this bigger you know, what are our priorities nationally? And that's on the table right now with Build Back Better, right? Like that's, that is what we're talking about nationally right now. Well, I think this leads really nicely into um, another question that I wanted to ask about sort of broadly thinking about policy. So um, as I mentioned at the start and as I think has been sort of a theme uh, throughout this, this webinar, um, improving health among pregnant and postpartum people and young children is, is really a critical part of the national and state conversation around policy right now. I know, Stephanie, you were just pointing to, to several of those things, but there's so many more that we could point to. Um, so the question I have for all of you um, is, what policies do you think could be most impactful in improving nutrition for these populations? And I think we'll go ahead and let's kick off with Sissy, because I know you started teeing this up already, as you mentioned, WIC. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on WIC and how um, Vouchers for Veggies has been involved uh, in that work. Yeah, so we've been involved in it. In a, I mean, really the policy change that we would love to see. I mean, we'd love to see these products are expert embedded in healthcare, absolutely. But I think just we have built this infrastructure around WIC to support the fruit and vegetable supplement, which is the um, CVB, and we should increase it. <laughs> we saw the temporary increases that are happening right now with the American Rescue Plan Act, and there's been um, some different bumps, and every time we're going back and like, you know, continue that temporary, but we'd like to see a permanent increase, and we'd like to see it up to the $50 a month. Um, which is the, what was recommended by um, NASM. I mean, it just makes sense. It's a win-win-win, and we talk about it also. Um, and our, our, I mean, there's a, people have talked about it before. There's a, there's a bunch of evidence, including our study, that these programs um, are uh, increase food security, increase um, health outcomes across the lifespan, and then, but also economically support. Uh, underserved neighborhoods. So we also did another study um, with Cal, uh, Colorado State University where we looked at the economic impact of increasing WIC to $35 um, a month for um, the um, uh, uh, pregnant person and the, and the children. And that would uh, result in a 1.1 to 1.6 um, economic multiplier, which means that would bring 11 to 30, $332 million into the economies of individual states. And the economic contribution nationally would be 2.81 billion. So I'm I'm just like this is kind of a no-brainer. Why would we spend like money on my program trying to create a separate infrastructure to serve folks that are already being that? Um, let's just fund that and fund the infrastructure better. <laughs> let's just do it. 
Absolutely agree. Um, and just as context for our audience, in case you're not as familiar with this issue, um, WIC does provide, it, WIC is in many ways uh, a national food prescription program, and it includes uh, a, a designated amount for fruits and vegetables, the, uh, the cash value benefit or CVB, um, and which in many ways is a produce prescription, right? It's a, a resources for produce, for individuals with an identified sort of health and nutrition need. Um, however, historically that's been limited to nine to eleven dollars per month, which obviously is not enough. And so as Sissy mentioned, there's been um, increases in light of the pandemic uh, over the last year, um, but those are temporary. And so a big piece here is whether or not that increase can be uh, made permanent into the future. So a great, great point. Um, next, I'd love to, to come back to Stephanie as you started to gesture to some broader programs as well. Um, what policy changes do you think could be most impactful in improving nutrition in families with young children? Yeah, I'm so I absolutely second what was just said. I think um, I'd love to see that study. I, I use it all over the place. Um, it'd be great. Um, and I, I think, you know, Truthfully, I would go even broader than that. I feel like the one that's on the table right now is the child tax credit, you know, making those increases, those changes permanent. Now, if you're a pregnant person without other children, that's not going to serve you in the immediate moment, but lots of people have other young children and certainly anybody with young children. I think for those who aren't a bit, uh, aware, um, changes to that program have made the child tax credit um, available to those with even low or no income, which was not the case before. They've increased the benefit amount and particularly have increased it for families with young children because there are additional expenses and stresses of that early period. And, and it finally recognizes that, which I think is amazing um, and is also um, you know, uh, providing it in a monthly format that, that then helps people plan. I mean, that is also a piece that we have been hearing over and over and over again is this stress piece of not being able to plan. Like, will I have a support? Will I not have support? When am I gonna have support? So being able to plan is a huge piece um, because then that relates into some bigger issues of things like childcare. You know, if we, um, peep the re why do people not have the food that they need. It's an income issue and frankly also an other expense issue if you have very expensive childcare because you need to work that inherently reduces what's available to you. Housing is another one. So all of these investments, although they don't seem like nutrition investments, are nutrition investments because they reduce food insecurity. And I think um, also Ashley made a great point and that's something we think about a lot too is you know, these folks that are like just over the eligibility limit for so many of these programs and they are struggling. So some of these like cliff effect, I don't know if people know that term, but like um, as you increase your income, you can get cut off from programs and actually end up in a worse spot than you were before when you had a lower income, but we're getting support from programs. So I think some very concerted work across uh, benefit programs to really eliminate those cliffs and ensure that there's this very smooth off ramp for people in a, and, and not you know, abruptly uh, removing supports um, before people are financially able to really get, meet their needs. I mean, this is such a fundamental human right to be able to eat properly. So, um, and particularly in, in pregnancy and early childhood. And, and I would say, when I say early childhood, I also just wanna make the point, I'm talking about family, right? Like I do care about the young child, but we care about the family because children exist in their family. So I think, you know, it has to be a family policy and not a child only policy, whatever we're doing. And the last thing I'll throw out, which I know I'm throwing out like 8 million things, <laughs> is universal basic income. And, and so I think we've more and more been moving toward um, supporting those kinds of policies as well. I think those are, are great points to bring to this conversation and ones that are, are really um, at the, the cutting edge of policy uh, in the United States. So I'm, I'm glad you brought those up. And, and last, I'd like to turn to Ashley and Becca to see what are some of the policy barriers that are preventing Food and Friends from expanding your medically tailored meal program um, to reach more pregnant people in the DC area? Yeah, so um, there's legislation right now that they're working on getting medically tailored meals um, covered by Medicare. Um, and so that's moving along, but we're hoping that once that passes, you know, it will move on to Medicaid and then other insurance. So. Um, you know, we can expand with our normal funding, um, but we'd be able to expand so much better and reach farther with 
you know, just health insurance being able to cover medically tailored meals um, for all their members. So that's what we're mostly looking at is that bill right now. I'll also just add to that a little bit. I fully agree. Um, and that would push, one of the reasons that would be so helpful is because we have um, 30 years of experience just getting other people food. Like Stephanie was mentioning, not everybody has health insurance. Um, and, you know, we know how to reach those folks. We know how to, um, to fundraise for those folks, but it makes that fundraising that much easier if the health insurance companies are doing their job and taking care of the health of their participants, their members. So if they're helping us out, you know, with that really big chunk, um, then we can continue to take the, you know, the community support and get everybody else what they need. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to jump in for those of you, for anyone listening who is interested in um, which bill uh, Ashley was mentioning, that's the medically tailored uh, home delivered meals demonstration pilot act of 2021 that would create a pilot in Medicare um, to cover medically tailored meals for certain populations. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that that could create um, a great uh, precedent for expanding coverage um, in the US. There are opportunities right now through Medicaid, Medicare Advantage and things like that. But of course, what we're seeing there is um, all of those current opportunities are sort of based on flexibility. So access is differing by plan, by geography, with huge parts of the country, huge parts of the population being totally left out. Um, and so I think that is an important point, point to bring up some of these efforts that are looking at broader change. Um, so a great point there. And I know that we're getting close to, to our time, but I did see one question come in in the Q&A that I really wanted to ask, because I think it's an important one and one that comes up all the time when we're speaking to food as medicine programs here in Massachusetts and across the country. Um, Emma asks, I'm curious for those of you uh, who are not partnering directly with health insurance providers, um, how you evaluate the health outcomes for pregnant, postpartum and infant populations and which ones have you been most easily able to evaluate? So this is really at its core a question about evaluation, um, recognizing that research drives policy uh, in this country. And so what outcomes have you focused on or would you encourage us to focus on um, as we evaluate uh, the impact of food as medicine interventions uh, in for these populations? I can speak briefly on that, even though um, the question asked about folks that aren't working with health insurance companies, because we ask um, about health behavior changes to all of our clients. And, you know, that's not necessarily in partnership with the health insurance companies. So we do, um, you know, surveys with clients anonymously about really their behavior change um, specific, you know, we do some just for folks who are getting meals and, and then folks that are working one-on-one -on -one with dietitians. Um, and we ask for specifics around, you know, what has changed in terms of what they're eating, um, outside of food and friends meals and what has changed in terms of their understanding of their health condition after working with food and friends dietitians. So those are the the really behavior change um, and knowledge change. That's what we look for. And Cece, I might just ask very briefly, I know you have tracked a number of um, outcomes related to your program uh, building upon WIC. Are there any that you would highlight as a focus moving forward? Um, I think I think this is, this is one of our um, tricks with, with the, um, I, look, I'm, I'm going to answer this in my quick way. There's a super wide body of evidence that increase the fruit and vegetable intake results in all of these fabulous health outcomes. And so, but why are we spending so much time researching whether it's like an ER visit or a this or a that when it's a preventative and then you're trying to, so healthcare needs to look differently at what we track. And I think if you track utilization of these programs, and which we know utilization leads to a certain amount of F and V intake. And if you actually do the whole food, the whole family care, so that it's not just mom, I mean, we know like we can do this, then let's skip a lot of this money on the research and just let's fund more programs. 
Um, that's my, <laughs> that's my, show. I'm sorry, I'm not a, not so much on the research side of that, but that, that's, that's my thing. And I think we, if we can model and just link that and say like when we know that if you eat more fruits and vegetables um, or, or a broader, even, even a broader range of healthy foods it, at this time, this is going to be um, really helpful. And we know kids, their palates for fruits and vegetables between one and zero and four. So if you just have more fruits and vegetables, this is good. Absolutely. I think that's um, a great note to end on since I think we're now at time, but yes, uh, ending on more fruits and vegetables uh, for families across the United States. So I'm going ahead and close out first, of course, by thanking our amazing presenters for this great conversation. And of course, for the great work that you're doing on the ground every day. Um, can't thank you enough for all of that. And second, I'd like to thank Community Serving for their continued partnership um, in this event. I know that this is our, our ninth annual Food as Medicine Symposium. I'm really looking forward to the 10th annual where perhaps we will once again for the first time in a couple of years um, be back in person. And then finally, I wanna thank you all, our attendees for joining us today for this uh, really timely conversation. And as we end today, I just wanna note that there are a few new resources that will be coming out in the new year focused on food as medicine. So think of them as your food as medicine holiday gifts for you all. Um, so I just wanna note that in January, we will be launching um, two new reports. First, an issue brief on addressing nutrition and food access in Medicaid um, with Chilpi uh, developed and co-authored uh, with the Food Trust and the Population Health Alliance. That's already available on our website, but we'll be holding a launch event officially in January. Second, the Food is Medicine Research Action Plan, which takes a deep dive into the current state of research and provides recommendations for next steps, um, which was developed uh, in collaboration with the Aspen Institute. And then finally, in early 2022, um, we will be launching the Food is Medicine Massachusetts Services Inventory. We know one of the huge issues we hear from healthcare in the state is not really knowing where these programs exist, who they can partner with, who they can refer, uh, their patients to. And so the inventory is going to look to provide um, a lot of that information in one place. So stay tuned for that. Um, anyone who's already on our mailing list will receive those updates, but also stay tuned to our website at www.chilpie.org. And so thank you all once again, um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful holiday season. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.